Hello, everybody. Tere. Uh, this is an English speaking uh, uh, discussion, so whoever doesn't uh, speak, speak English, then you also have a, a translator there to help you <laughs> with the sign language this time. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. My name is uh, Aini Karas. I'm the CEO of uh, Milton New Nordics. And I regularly moderate different kind of discussions, so this is not such a new thing for me. But I just realized when I was driving here that I've uh, moderated, like, I think, tens of uh, discussions in Estonia, and only two in Estonian. <laughs> so Aww. it's always in English, because I happen to bring in a lot of friends from uh, other countries who doesn't speak Estonian. So therefore, it's again English this time. But we are uh, here to talk about uh, diversity. And before uh, I will introduce our lovely guests here today, I actually wanted to ask a few questions from the audience. Because from what I see, at least it looks diverse. And uh, let's uh, figure out how, how do you see it. So I would just uh, like you to um, raise your hand if uh, your answer is yes to the question that no matter what organization uh, you are part of today or where you work at, can you say your team is diverse enough? If it's a yes, hand up. All right, so I would say maybe 20% of the audience said yes. Okay, uh, a next question would be, if you take a look on the Estonian uh, leaders, um, opinion makers, politicians, uh, CEOs. It's like basically the picture you see in the media every day. And when you imagine that, take a look on that picture, is that diverse enough? If it's a yes, hand up. Oh. <laughs> okay, we're doomed now. And. Um, Third question, do we even have to talk about diversity? Okay, uh, now I got the hands. <laughs> so we're good to go. As you can see, audience wants us to discuss about diversity. But uh, first, uh, let's get to know each other. At least uh, there are, I know at least there is one person who's first time in Estonia. Are you first time? No. No, okay. So since Ahmed over there, uh, today, very first time in his life, stepped on the grounds of Estonia. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give him uh, the first word to uh, tell a little bit about his background. And also, maybe at the end, you might uh, answer to the question, why do you think that diversity is important in society or in the companies? Yes, uh, and thank you very much, first of all, for this lovely invitation and the opportunity to be here. Um, as Annika said, it's my first time here uh, in um, Estonia and, and, and Tallinn. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to participate in this um, uh, festival for democracy and, and these issues. Um, my name is Ahmed Rahman. Um, I'm Somali-born but Swedish citizen. Uh, I came to Sweden when I was 12 years old um, from the civil war in uh, Mogadishu, Somalia. Uh, and as you can imagine, um, you know, one day playing in, in the sand and the desert, the next day in the cold, cold Swedish country. Yeah, it's very difficult to, to adjust uh, uh, very fast. Um, but I was very lucky. I learned the language uh, very well. Um, and I knew that coming from a war country that I want to contribute to the world, uh, especially going back to the old country and, and helping out. So I want to be a doctor. Uh, and that has led me to my start uh, on my career. I studied natural science in high school. Um, I got a scholarship to the U.S. Um, thinking that uh, it was my first time outside of Sweden. So my first country outside of Sweden was to New York in the U.S. Um, and there I learned that the world is much more diverse uh, than what I imagined. Sweden being um, very, um, still growing diversity, but where, where I live it was very diverse in the suburb. But in the inner city it's not as diverse. So when I came to New York, uh, my whole world just you know, turned upside down. Uh, a lot of doors opened, a lot of opportunities, uh, and I started to study international relations. Um, and ever since I've been engaged on working on how do we um, get more diverse society, how do we build a better future, not only for um, Somalis or uh, Swedes, but also for the whole world. 
Um, so I work in the UN in Geneva. Um, I went back to Somalia with the UN. Uh, I became Swedish abroad uh, because everybody asked me, uh, tell me about Sweden. I have no idea what Sweden was. Um, so when I came back to Sweden, um, I realized that uh, we need to change the dialogue, the discussion. Uh, and you have two options. You can either stand on the side and complain, or you can you know, uh, um, get your hands dirty and get in there and work on the issues. So I started something called uh, Järveckan, which is similar to this festival where people come together to talk, and similar to Almedana, where we also get inspiration from. Uh, I started that in 2017, um, uh, and this year, 2019, we are now 53,000 people who are visits there to talk about issues relating to diversity and new immigrants. Um, I worked in the U.S. Embassy, uh, also with diversity issues, and right now I work at Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have 2,000 member companies, and my goal is to help them, um, to guide them in this issue of uh, uh, diversity and, and talents. How do we find the right talents? How do we get the business to grow? And how do we get Stockholm region above all, uh, which produces almost 30% of the GDP in Sweden? How do we get that talent that is hidden right now in, in the multicultural areas of Sweden? How do we get them to the business leaders? So that's very short about my background and, and why I care about these issues. Um, and it's very obvious, you know, I, I'm look at myself, you know, my color and my name. Um, diversity is not an option, um, at least to me, and it's not an option to anyone. That's why also you guys are here, because you understand the importance of it. So for me, I, I work with this uh, day in and day out, both on the professional side with the Sh Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, but also on my free time with the NGOs, uh, the Global Village Foundation. Uh, and I think that, you know, today we, we see globalization is increasing. We see that uh, a lot of the countries right now, like here, um, the people who are born here generation have reached the level of um, productivity. Um, where these countries can grow right now is to make sure that the talents that are hidden in the diversity and the newcomers are um, taken care of and, and are, are well used. So that's why I care a lot about diversity. Thanks. I think uh, as we talked in a bus before when we came, then you are like the best example of a global village citizen. Yeah. Because your story is just a bit crazy, I must say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So I'm going to make a like 30 second break uh, to the introduction because I see a lot of people out there and as well as out here. I see that at least the front row of the stage is a place to sit. So everybody who are in the corners, you can actually walk in here. Uh, at least three people can sit here and also in there. So I you don't dry. have to <laughs> be out there. Yeah, exactly. So don't be afraid. Uh, this is a global village, so it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> you know? OK. Cool. So we at least got a few more people seated, uh, but still afraid of the stage, though. <laughs> Let's go on. So uh, uh, for a second, I'd like uh, another person who's not from Estonia to uh, talk about herself. So, um, uh, Pia from Finnair. Thank you. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Pia Karho and I'm, I work for Finnair today. When I was listening, Ahmed, to your story, I think my story is quite the opposite of yours, <laughs> I have to say. So mm. I was born on the eastern part of Finland on, on a small village and that was not diverse on the way like you described diversity at all. And um, uh, I, I think uh, one of the moments when I got the most excited, the first moment that I, I remember that I got excited about diversity was in the first grade in school, when there was a Japanese man coming to the school. And I think it was the first time that I met an Asian person in my life. And I thought that was super exciting. And, and he was talking about things that, that we had never heard of. So I think that's the first time that I, that I got excited about the, the kind of uh, diversity in the world. But since that, um, uh, I've uh, studied business in, in my life and had the pleasure to live in Texas and Hong Kong. And uh, I, I think once you, you live in different countries, uh, you not only l learn about, let's say, consumers on those countries, but you really learn about uh, the different way of life, different li kind of history, what it brings and all of those things. So extremely valuable time for, for any of us. Currently, I work at Finne, heading one of our three business units uh, called Custom Experience. And basically, the role of my team, 3,500 people, is to serve all our customers. And, and many of the people work at the customer front. 
Last year we had 13 million passengers traveling with us and, and quite a diverse group of people with very diverse needs as well. So that's kind of my angle to the diversity uh, in, in my everyday life is that, that how can we fulfill the needs with the different needs that these consumers do have? How do we serve them on, on kind of small everyday micro moments on, on different touch points? And also how do we develop Finnair service in short term and long term so that it addresses the different needs that there are in, in the market? So that, that's a big challenge for us. Okay, we're going to dig into those challenges later a bit more, yes. but now let's hear uh, Kaira. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Kaira Tero. I'm HR manager in uh, Rimi Estonia. Uh, I've been a part of that company now already 12 years. Uh, it's kind of international company. Our uh, mother company is based in uh, Sweden. Uh, and we have quite <coughs> diverse uh, team in total company. Uh, what diversity means for me is uh, much wider than only age, gender, nationality. I think it has much more colors in it. And our employees, we have nearly 3,000 employees and directly responsible for their work happiness, is a very diverse team actually without even thinking about uh, only gender or age or, or nationality and one of my strongest beliefs uh, in, in very very long years already has been that uh, you can learn from anyone and you can learn from anything mm. and every group of uh, people is it a family is it a organization is it a society is a very good environment to grow as a human beings and diversity is something that really supports that thank you for that now as uh, many of us here we are just philosophers or practitioners but there is actually one person who uh, has a title of professor, yeah? And, and uh, Anvrealo has really, um, should I say, investigated human brain. No, no, I haven't. <laughs> no, you haven't? No, no, okay, no, no. but no. tell us about it yourself. <laughs> so yes, hello, um, good, uh, good afternoon. So um, uh, my name is Anvrealo. I'm extremely happy to be here, so thank you so much for this lovely invitation. So I'm a professor at the University of Tartu and also a professor at the University of Warwick in, in the UK. Um, I do research on personality. So I haven't really <laughs> examined people's brains because this is more about neuroscience. But I do know about why people differ. I know quite a bit about diversity. I know that each of you in this audience, you know, you are different because you have a different set of personality traits. Most likely you have somewhat different values, maybe not so different worldviews because you seem to be interested in diversity. So there are certain things I can probably tell about you, but it's not like I know everything. Um, when we talk about diversity, I think I really like what Gaira said. It's not just about ethnicity or culture or gender. It's about many different things, but I was also thinking, you know, about my personal experiences when it comes to cultural differences, because I'm 100% Estonian. I'm as Estonian as anyone could possibly be. So it goes back like hundreds of years. We've done some family history quite recently. Very disappointing, nothing <laughs> exciting coming out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. So just, no, no, I'm very proud of being so Estonian. Anyhow, so, um, it all started, I've done quite some research on cultural differences, you know, I'm really interested in why people do things differently in different places, you know, why people believe in <coughs> certain things in some parts of the world and, you know, quite the opposite in other parts of the world. So I was thinking before this session, how did it all begin? And I must admit, and some of you may sort of think this is a bit strange, but it all started in 1984 when I was sent to a summer camp 
to a pioneer camp because I grew up in the Soviet Union. I'm old enough to remember those times. So I was sent to the Crimea, to the Soviet summer camp. And it was indeed a life-changing experience because I didn't speak any Russian. It was all in Russian. And basically, you met those children from, I don't know, from the shores of the Baltic Sea to the... You Caucasus know, mountains. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> just Caucasus, but also basically to the Japanese sort of sea of, what is it, White Sea. So I think it was the first time in my young life I realized that people are so different and so similar at the same time because, you know, 13, 14 year olds, what is most important? It's most important is to sort of fall in love, you know, do certain things. It's all super universal. But at the same time, the way people speak, what people do, what they like, what they love, you see the diversity in that. So I think it was the first time for me to understand that there are some sort of universals, you know, of, and this is exactly what we've been examining, you know, what are the cultural universals, what are the things which are pretty much the same all around the world, and what are the specifics, because always there are some specifics as well. So this is how it all started, and ever since that time, I think I've been just sort of trying to uh, pursue my passion to research and live and work in different countries. So in Iceland, in Sweden, or I even spent some time in Finland as a graduate student. I did my postdoc in Belgium, and later lived and worked in Holland for two years. And now I've been in the UK soon for four years. So, um, yeah, and it all started, you know, in Artek in 1984. Um, I'm quite certain about it. So there's something good about the Soviet regime, I think. <laughs> That's the end point of my short introduction. <laughs> You say that you, you're very, very Estonian, and, and yes. at the beginning you mentioned the Tartu and all of that, yeah, but you know, yeah. your English accent is very British, <laughs> so it, it, <laughs> that's surprising. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's because I work in the UK, yeah. and <laughs> actually Evgeny studied at the same university where I'm working right now, so I think it's time for him to introduce yeah, himself. Yeah, very good. Mm. That was a very good bridge build, so yes. your turn. Hi, uh, my name is Evgeny. Most of you know who I am, so I'm not going to dwell onto my uh, CV, but uh, yes, there are very few things that uh, unite me and Anu. Uh, I was born two, two years after she went to that fatal camp, that. <laughs> uh, but, but I did graduate from the same university where she, she teaches now, uh, and we've had a few uh, points of uh, contact uh, in terms of uh, very similar issues actually in the in the previous years, uh, um, but uh, we can talk about that a bit later. Otherwise, uh, yes, I've uh, uh, unlike uh, Anu, uh, I've uh, personally gone through a process of uh, of uh, being an alien in uh, independent Estonia at the age of five. So I started my school uh, in 1991. Uh, I went to an Estonian school, although I didn't properly speak Estonian at the time. My first uh, language is Russian. And uh, my whole sort of school period has been a process of, of uh, how to navigate um, this kind of uh, um, rather uh, explosive, I would say, process of, of becoming your own uh, as a Russian in Estonia. Uh, which I think I understand very well, uh, how one can do it. Uh, it's a different question whether one wants to do that uh, uh, to a full extent or not. Um, and as a result of that, I suppose that this is um, uh, something that has, uh, as through this personal experience, has interested me both academically and practically as well. So I've uh, my second master's degree, not from Warwick, but from the LSE, is in comparative politics uh, centered on nationalism and ethnicity, so these kinds of historical and sociological issues behind it. And uh, uh, some people already got bored. <laughs> <laughs> And Th uh, that happens <laughs> when politicians start talking. That's you know? all right. That's all right. I'm, yeah, I'm used to that. I'm used to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, and and in a sense, it, it it of course shows you how to what extent uh, these issues are very contingent. 
socially constructed, one could say, but it, but it also the complexity of the social dialogue in any uh, different society and how fast it can actually change, mm -hmm. how easy it is to become for somebody who is own to become again alien or foreign. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have seen that historically, but we can see it now in, in many countries across, uh, across the continent as well. And, uh, and maybe one sort of uh, important thing to say from my perspective is that when, when we talk about diversity, for me it's a, a flip side of discrimination. So it's a nice word for discrimination really, uh, or a sort of, uh, you know, different side of the same same process and it's it's my it's quite nice to discuss uh, diversity so it's like this it gives you a warm feeling uh, and then you don't have to talk about discrimination which is nasty uh, but you one shouldn't it's like you know talking about prosperity is so good because you don't have to talk about poverty uh, whereas actually the problem is poverty not prosperity uh, but it's much easier to discuss it so one when, when we discuss diversity one shouldn't forget that the flip side of it is discrimination, which is inhumane. And therefore, for me, uh, uh, one cannot forget the fundamental question, is that uh, fight against discrimination or promotion of diversity in positive terms is never fundamentally about economic gain, but is about fundamental freedoms, is about equality, is about ethics fundamentally, and not about economic gains. Economic gains can be there. But if, even if the economic gains are not there, one should strive for uh, equality and diversity and, and fight against discrimination. Thank you for that, because uh, I think the title of our discussion was uh, diversity as a tool for sustainable business success. Yeah, yeah. yeah do I remember it correctly? Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I have exactly the same kind of impression that we actually need to take our discussion a bit wider, mm -hmm. because if you know, the basis is not okay, then there's nothing to build on it. Uh, also to the audience that we are also taking questions. So if at any point anyone feels that you want to ask something, you have to just put your hand up. And uh, from time to time, I will take a look around and I'll try to remember you. And then uh, we'll give you a word. But um, when preparing for this um, discussion, uh, I decided uh, that uh, let's choose two angles to to di discuss. One would be the bias, and another would be inclusive decision making. So these are kind of uh, more concrete uh, topics because otherwise we're just gonna wander around a lot, and we can continue discussing uh, uh, till late uh, evening, uh, and nobody's gonna leave here. So uh, let's first uh, a little bit uh, try to talk about bias. And uh, as I understood correctly, you're all supporting the diverse society concept, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. So nobody's against, <laughs> which is, uh, of course, uh, a little bit, uh, ma it makes uh, this discussion difficult because if nobody's against, we're just going to maybe sugarcoat each other a bit. So <laughs> let's try to bring in those um, pros and, and cons so that it will be only not the nice stories around. But uh, yeah, about biases, I think every day in life we unconsciously do it, even though if we don't want to. So I was thinking that maybe, uh, Anu, you could first a little bit open your views on the matter and then we could take it from there. Sure, yes. Um, I think this unconscious bias, it's been one of the buzzwords. Um, in psychology and also in business and in organizations for quite some years now. Um, as a psychologist, as I must say, I'm not overly enthusiastic about it, if I may say so. I think it's one of the concepts, and it very much relates to what Yevgeny said just a few uh, minutes ago, like when we talk about diversity, we talk about diversity and we don't really want to talk about discrimination. And when we talk about unconscious bias, we talk about something which is not conscious because it allows us to justify discrimination in a way because, of course, we do this because we are not aware of this. And it's absolutely fine. Let's discuss you know, what kind of unconscious biases you have and maybe we can all become better people this way. 
So um, there are tons of studies examining this issue and also uh, whether it's actually possible to sort of like, you know, all these training sessions. I'm sure Finna has those as well, like, you know, how to be aware of your unconscious biases and everything. To be honest, research doesn't really support this because at the level of individuals, it's not a stable characteristic. I may have quite some biases this afternoon. If you test me again tomorrow morning, it's all gone. And you know, a day after tomorrow, it might be different again. So I'm not saying we don't have those biases, but it's not a stable characteristic and we don't really have enough research to show that it sort of exists, and even more importantly, but it allows us to predict people's behavior, because it's only important if it's gonna show somehow, somewhere. Having said that, of course biases are. We all have certain biases, but I would say that in Estonia, in 2019, it's so much more important to talk about conscious biases <laughs> okay, than unconscious let's talk about biases. <laughs> so that's my personal view because uh, we all know what these are and we should address them and not hide them, you know, behind this label of, you know, it's unconscious and we do those microaggressions without knowing. I think we know exactly what we are doing and, and most of us are quite well aware of this. Okay. So, yeah. Well, let's a little bit oh, talk but about But before we go on, sorry, I should have, as a proper <laughs> researcher, I should have defined <laughs> unconscious bias yeah, what because is it? some of you in the audience may not know what it is. So basically we are talking about social stereotypes you have about people who belong to different groups than yours. So it could be about different ethnic groups, it could be about, you know, different gender, it could be about anyone, and it's unconscious because it's automatic. It's somehow in your brain, it's been ingrained in that so that you're not aware of this yourself. So, and of course it has, according to some researchers and many popular myths, it has important impact on how you behave, what you do, and mm -hmm. how you discriminate mm -hmm. against other people. So that's a simple definition of unconscious bias. Okay, Ahmed wants to continue. <laughs> no, I, I do agree with you that mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, to, to both of you, in terms of diversity versus discrimination mm -hmm. discussion, mm -hmm. uh, conscious and unbiased con uh, mm -hmm. um, biases. Um, I think that, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we are facing is that Th this reality, we are human beings, um, and it's not for me uh, uh, justifying that you can, you know, uh, discriminate people or, or um, not have consequences of your action or your thinking. Um, but we are human beings, and you know, this brain is over 200,000 years old. Um, hardware that has been framed by people living in a certain regions, long, far away from each other. Um, tons of war and killings and, 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 you know, ideas of what the other is and uh, through culture, through how we betray each other. Um, and then since, you know, the last 50, uh, 100 years, um, y you have more globalization, but at the same time you have more technology that can allow you to spread that discrimination or unbiased or unconscious ideas of the other. Uh, and now 2019 with social media, that's why we're having all these difficulties on addressing these issues um, because our ego and our dark side is the same time there present in, in, in technology as well as our good side. So, I mean, for me, it's, it's very important that the way to fight these issues is um, not, I mean, the best way to, to, how do you say, vaccinate yourself against this um, the idea of the other or discrimination or, or un unbiased, um, uh, unconscious bias is to actually have people mix. I mean, th there's no other way you can learn about the other um, unless you meet them. Uh, and this is why it's very important um, to continue having the discussion, to continue creating meeting places where you bring people together. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, to leave that idea of um, the other. Uh, and we see that right now uh, in all over Europe and also, of course, in Sweden, um, where the um, current political um, system uh, is using that uh, fear, fear of the other um, uh, and fear of the immigrants particularly to to certain agenda, uh, to maintain power uh, for themselves, 
and to divide people, um, especially in, in countries where um, diversity is increasing. Um, but the only way to go, to go around this, again, is to really create that uh, a place, a forum for people to talk and to meet each other. And this is where we have the biggest challenge. Because, you know, there will be uh, people who think others, but unless you, you know, have discussion every day, it's not going to go away. So we really have to remind ourselves. But at the same time, it cannot, it cannot justify um, how we are unable to give people rights um, by, um, you know, by either taking distance. Uh, for example, when I came back to Sweden after seven years abroad, I had um, good education from the U.S. I worked with the U.N. Um, I came back and I live in Tensta, Rinkeby, which is very famous in Sweden in terms of people think it's, you know, like no go zone, whatever, which is not true either because there's a lot of immigrants. So when I looked for a job, it was very difficult to find a job, even though I had a really good education. And, you know, there was no one who was, how you say, um, who were, you know, um, very, very direct saying that we don't want you because you are this or you're from there. It was always like, thank you for applying <laughs> uh, and nothing more, which is very frustrating because you actually came back all the way home to contribute to your country. So we, we have to live up to the rules and we have to live up to our standards, especially in, in well-developed uh, democratic countries, and especially where the majority are still um, uh, not allowing others to go into politics where decisions are made. So we have to look at these issues, both economically, socially, but also uh, in terms of politics. And the best way to do that, except this discussion, is to make sure, th sure that our media, our culture, is diverse. Because we people, we, we repeat what we see. And if you, if you tell someone 100 times they are a bad person, they're going to be a bad person. Um, so what we see on TV and, and the diversity in that media is really important, as well as creating these meetings. And we, w when we asked before the question uh, from the audience, like the picture you see in Estonian media, is it diverse? And there was no hands. Yeah. So then, <laughs> based on what you said now, and that I would say, we have a problem here. Mm -hmm. But uh, referring to what you just said earlier, I wanted to ask Pia that, uh, so if Ahmed today would come to Finnair and apply <laughs> for a job, would you answer, thank you for applying, or would it be anything else? Well, we actually have a quite a diverse uh, workforce nowadays. It wasn't like that 30 years ago, but nowadays we do have. So we have actually people, 44 different nationalities working for Finner. So therefore, definitely today and, and let's say 10, 20 years already, we would have definitely welcomed you to the interview if you had applied to a position that, that your competencies are there for pilot mechanics. A digital developer, mm. marketing person. Not me. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you can learn any of yes. those if you really want. Yeah. Pilot? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But maybe to continue, I, I think you used a, a nice word, vaccination, towards mm. the biases there when you were talking. And, and I, I think one, one thing that uh, particularly in the, in the corporate world um, makes us consciously being biased or unbiased is, is rush and, and speed to, to conclusions. Um, plate is full of things that you need to conclude and, and proposals you need to make and, and uh, profit that, that is needed in a way. So, so I think that's kind of the thing that, that we, that's an excuse for ourselves not to have those dialogues that are needed in a way, uh, always. But definitely agree what you said about that, that uh, dialogue is the, is the only way to um, mature any topic or any decision and, and thus overcome the, the biasness of the, of the original team who, who was building the decision. I think um, in my early career, uh, one of my bosses really taught me to uh, have these validation discussions. And uh, then uh, maybe I was a little bit more, uh, let's say, even, even um, wanted to get things done really fast. Mm. So I was a bit, bit uh, kind of that, do I really need to do this? But, but I really learned that, that any of those discussions, all of those discussions added value to the solution that we were building. So I think that's important to really take the time for those dialogues uh, and, and, and kind of mature the topic. And, and also, of course, it, it's about engaging people uh, what will be the next phase. So, so that's what I do, for example, myself, that I, I love to um, just have 
unofficial discussions with our people, cabin crew members, people at the airport, people at the contact centers, digital teams, and just kind of validate the thoughts that are there and, and therefore get new perspectives and maybe risks that are related to implementation or things like that. So dialogue definitely needed. Kaira, what do you think? Uh, you, you mentioned before that you have 3,000 people working at Rimi, right? So how do you make sure every day that uh, people who hire other people are free from unconscious as well as conscious bias? Do you have tools for that? Do you have rules for that? Because there are some things, I mean, you can force, but there are some things that also need time and to kind of evolve naturally. Because we grow, every day we grow. I mean, even when we're old, we are still learning. So how do you do it, that Rimi? Uh, very good question, but I think it's, uh, it's basically impossible because we tend to like people who are similar to, to ourselves. But how to uh, kind of help a bit in here is uh, that you do not uh, do this recruitment decision uh, on yourself. You have some other eyes. Uh, and uh, there are always uh, several interviews before the hiring decision and many team members involved. This is one of the possibilities to avoid that. But uh, I would lie if I say that uh, we don't have uh, this, this kind of discrimination at all, that we don't hire people who we uh, like more and who are more like us, similar to us. But we, we do our best to avoid it. Yeah. Has anybody uh, used uh, ever, I think maybe two of you mm -hmm. as your representatives of the companies, I've heard of these kind of tools like when you somebody is applying for a job, then the first round you hide the gender and the age, uh, even the nationality sometimes. Because if you know that there are these biases in the society, then mm -hmm. uh, you make sure that you are actually hiring people based on their experience and their knowledge and not about this kind of background. No? No experience? No, no. Uh, no. Not really, but what we have done uh, in certain managerial positions, uh, we expect uh, the gender balance, for instance, uh, to be equal among candidates. And to the final round, we also choose based on that. <laughs> to make it more diverse and give opportunities to, to if we are talking about gender, the both gender uh, mm -hmm. uh, present representations and, um, and also what comes to, uh, to age. But nowadays, uh, what I suggest to people who uh, apply for different jobs, uh, don't show your age. You don't need to do that, or, or even gender, or don't, don't put your, your picture there. There's no need for that. What matters I is your competences. I just want to ask one question from Yevgeny, because I have actually analyzed Estonian uh, political parties uh, from the angle of gender equality, and Social Democratic uh, Party has the best numbers in there. So you are the most uh, equal w when I look at the uh, party board and also the representatives in the lists and all of that. So how has that happened? Did you have to force it or is it hard something work. that's yeah, it's normal? It's, it's been very hard work. Of course, it's, it's not easy uh, because it's, uh, it's basically uh, quite plainly and simply, it's, uh, it's a loss of entitlement for men. Uh, in terms of, of candidate lists, for example, all parties would say, yeah, but we just don't have any women in the electoral district, where do we get them? And then you see five men sitting around the table, where do we get them? But we have five men here. Uh, so this is how it works. And then when you bring somebody in, then, then of course it's, uh, it's going to you know, create tensions. So it's, 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 a, it's a long term work uh, to do, and, but it's possible. It's, it is clearly possible. We have, for example, uh, in 2015 previous parliamentary elections, mm -hmm. only one uh, woman was uh, number one in her regional list, uh, even in our party. Uh, and this time we had four, I think, uh, out of 12. So it's a third, still not there quite, but you know, it's substantial Im improvement. And in the parliament, actually, we had 50-50 uh, uh, voted by, by, uh, by the voters this time. 
which is of course part of the of the list placement. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. Now, one of uh, females left to European Parliament. Now we have 60-40 again, but mm -hmm. but that's that's quite good. But it, but it's yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's long work. It's 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 very difficult. Can I say something uh, about academia? Because we talk about business organizations and we talk about political parties when it comes to recruitment. I think academia, at least in the UK, it's definitely more egalitarian in terms of our ethnic or cultural diversity because I've sat on several recruitment boards. It doesn't matter where you come from. I mean, it's absolutely not important. Nobody even asks this question because I mean, it all, what matters is your publications, you know, your credentials as a researcher, as a professor, as a teacher, as a lecturer, or your, I don't know, work outside of academia. So nobody would ask any questions about your age or about your ethnic background. And I was thinking before the session, we also had a short uh, a discussion with Pia just before the session started, uh, University of Warwick uh, has, uh, in its academic staff, it's more than 40% uh, from outside of UK. And I think in my department, it's even more. It's maybe 60%, you know, are uh, non-UK people working for a department. Uh, it's the same at Oxford. It's the same at Cambridge. I'm pretty sure it's maybe even more in some very good um, American universities. So what I was thinking, I was thinking before the session, you know, this sort of diversity in terms of educational background, in terms of cultural background, this is exactly what is driving the excellence, you know, in those you know, what we like to think are the world's best universities. So yeah, so we do certain things, as you said. We don't ex explicitly ask for gender, but of course, sometimes you can guess. You know, if it's Jane Smith, it's quite likely. But you know, gender is not a binary thing, that's another thing. So that's another discussion. It's not a binary female-male thing. It's so much more diverse if I may say so. So that's another discussion. Mm -hmm. So first Pia and then Ahmed. I was just uh, kind of continuing on the mm. uh, long work around our building diversity. Mm. For example, at Finnair, 8% of our pilots are women mm. and 92% and are men. Mm. And, and not that k kind of the gender really matters <laughs> on, on a pilot job, mm. but that's, for example, one topic that we have kind of uh, picked up that, that we want to drive uh, more kind of gender equality within that group mm. of people. But and now we've been doing it for a couple of years via different kind of campaigns when there's a recruitment process open or something like that. But we have also learned the same thing that we have to start even earlier. <laughs> so we have to go to the eighth graders in school and, and kind of bring it up, up there and there drive the interest towards the pilot yes. job. Absolutely. It's it's not a man's job yeah. <laughs> in a way. It, it's it's a job for anybody who's who's interested on on mechanics and and um, has very good patience and, and patience and nerves. So, Ahmed. No, I I think this is um, if if we really want to change it, of course, uh, HR and and how we interview and and uh, to even get through the door is very important. And, and there are some countries who have tried and companies who have tried using um, CVs without no names. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but I think that the most important thing that, that I have learned uh, working in this field is that uh, unless the leaders in that company are on board, uh, unless we have tools and data that we can see from year to year how that diversity, if it has grown or not, as you said now, you know, in terms of how many women are pilots, if we don't have that data and if you don't have the leadership uh, and it's a natural part of the business reporting, then nothing changes. Um, and I, I find it also very difficult sometimes, this discussion, because it, when we talk about data, most people are open to when we talk about gender equality, men and women. Um, but diversity uh, uh, is also within women. Uh, you have women who have easier to get a job if they are from certain backgrounds, especially if they are white. Uh, let's just be honest. Um, and they are women who don't have the same opportunity if they are of different color, ethnicity, in, in that sense, or religion, what they, hair, if, what they wear in their uh, headscarf or not. So we also have to talk about diversity deeper than just men and women or uh, gender in that sense, or sexuality. Um, when we do that, it's very difficult, both for politicians and, and majority people, to accept that. 
uh, the idea of diversity in that deep level and that accountability. Because it means that you have to confront uh, issues that relate to rights um, than just business opportunity, as we were talking about uh, earlier. So what we need is that uh, in, in each company and, and actually political decision on how to measure this thing. It does not mean that, uh, like in the US, where you have to have a quota system. It's not what it's about. That, that is, for me, at least different system. Um, and as you were saying before that, you know, if you ask people, the, uh, can we not get more women? They, you know, if all of them are men, they will say, we don't know even if it's possible. Uh, but the same thing, if you also have a room full of people with certain color, they will also say, we cannot find diversity in terms of ethnicity. Uh, so we are facing the same challenge there. Um, but it's very difficult to talk about this issue again. Um, and I think that's what we have to raise. Um, we have to get those business leaders on board and we have to get those businesses to decide that you know, in five years we will have that amount of diversity. And, and we're not doing that as a quota, we're doing that. We will give this job to the best person possible in terms of skills, but it does not mean that that person has to always be of certain color. Um, that's very difficult to unite, you know, in terms of how we, how we, uh, our idea of liberalism and our idea of the right, you know, um, that that is, you know, minded in our head. So unless we change, that's not going to change. So but we, we have to move it that. It sounds a bit like a vicious circle that you know we all think the same. Therefore, there is no different voice out there, and we're not going to change within those groups. How do we break those groups? Then? Yeah, but that's 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 why we have to have those data. And this is you know we we did that at the chamber and also at the at the Global Village Foundation. We measure it, um, and we're going to measure it even more. I mean. Uh, we are some of our business partners and, and members of the chamber have clear goals. For example, Axel Jonsson, which is a huge family-owned uh, old company, they have decided that they will reflect Sweden's diversity. So around 25% of Swedish population is foreign uh, background. And they said that in our company, 25% has to be people from other countries or other backgrounds than you know people who've lived here for generations in Sweden. And now they are around 19%. Um, and, and it's not only about these easy jobs, because the first thing people do is that, oh, we need a janitor, we can have diversity there. But if you say we need a, a diversity on the board or in the leadership, different, different talks. Um, and this is now something that is becoming even more actual, uh, actual uh, more important in Sweden, because yesterday, I think it was yesterday, they looked at uh, the, it's like NASDAQ, how you say that in Sweden? Uh, uh, Same. Yes. Um, and there are like 332 companies. Um, only 30% of them, oh sorry, 30 of them, which is, um, you know, 10%, have a woman who is a CEO. Uh, so unless you make that data available, um, people are not going to listen or engage or change. So the question here is also, what data is available? And how can we get that into the political discussion? Both in terms of women as a group, but also women as diversity uh, in within that w group. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, finally, we have one question from the audience. So can we have a microphone? Okay, two, oh, three. So can you oh, pass touch some nerve yep, here. over there? <laughs> Let's have a first question and then... Hi, uh, my name is Marili. Um, and I, will, I would actually like to discuss uh, about diversity from a di different angle. Um, uh, the, the topic is broad and now I'm thinking and gathering my thoughts, so um, I think that we, we should address the issue, what kind of value does diversity bring us? Um, last year I, um, I had a really, really, um, I think, a life-changing experience in Israel when I met with, um, with the new generation of uh, startup leaders who were all women and who were uh, mentored by a um, senior, um, senior uh, citizen who was, happened to be also a woman, but also had a, a lots of experience in the entrepreneurial world and started to mentor new generation. And she uh, was focusing only on women, but at the different age groups. Um, we had a uh, one-day meeting with all the leaders who were representing from tw uh, 20 years old, 40 years old, and plus. Um, uh, uh, they all were successful. They all had um, uh, raised money from the investors. 
Um, and what was so wonderful about that was that they had no prior experience. Their only background was that they had their mentor, they were empowered, uh, they uh, learned a lot, they were an enthusiastic, and what was the greatest value about it was that they uh, were addressing issues and problems within the society which were not addressed before. So, um, uh, and that, uh, that um, brought uh, me to, uh, to realize that, uh, that uh, uh, there is the possibility for the future. When we open up the, uh, the, um, uh, our doors uh, to div div diversity, empower and give the, give the skills, then the people themselves uh, find their po inner power to address the issues which are neglected. They um, have the, uh, the, uh, the courage to, uh, to address the technology world, which has been driving our world for the 50 years uh, and has been led by the men who are in the age group of 25 to 45. I rest my case. And the question was? I would like to have the discussion among you on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anybody who wants to? I'm the only one. Or is somebody yeah. else Do you want to reflect on that? Yeah. OK. Pia? I think a very, very important point, that particularly when we're looking for true innovations. I mean, sometimes we talk about innovations that are actually just an, you know, a next version of something we already have. And um, just what I wanted to build on that one is that, that let's say that we at Finnair are having a, having a you know, great I innovation in my mind. Very easily I validate it with another airline <laughs> in a way or, 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 in a, or another corporate. But what really adds value is, is if I talk to you know, somebody from a totally different world like you or, or you. Or so that, that we really kind of... Um, engage pe people who are really different and, and who kind of come from the different part of the society as a whole. So that way you can really add value and, and kind of uh, make the evolution actually a revolution. Thank you. Uh, we had one more question we would like to reflect on. Yeah. Oops. OK. Uh, in many EU countries, there are laws and legislation around um, what you can put in a job advertisement and what you cannot put in a job advertisement. And uh, in many EU countries, it's a requirement for companies to advertise jobs with the recommended salary actually in the job advert. Mm. Estonia is one of some EU countries that does not require that. And so the majority of jobs, people will apply and then they'll go to the interview and then they will be asked to state their um, required salary at the end of the interview. Um, given that there's at least anecdotal evidence that women are more likely to nominate themselves for a lower salary than men, uh, is this not a generator of inequality within Estonia? And um, how could uh, is is there is there any chance of Estonia requiring that companies place salaries in job advertisements? Thank you. What's your name? Stuart. Stuart, that's a very good question. Estonia has the highest pay gap in Europe, by the way. But um, who wants to reflect on it first? Evgeny? I can, I, mm -hmm. I can talk a lot about it. <laughs> Shortly uh, then. Yes. That's another uh, tough fight. Um, I think that Estonian society as a whole hasn't really got past the question why to deal with, uh, with the issue uh, before even getting to question of how to do it. I remember when I, I became a minister for equality, including gender equality in 2015, then I presented uh, to the cabinet uh, a, a set of sort of first steps that could be taken, which is basically what the, what the specialists in the ministry and experts had already you know, worked out for a long time, but, but there was no political will to, to enact them. So, so I presented them to the cabinet, and I will probably remember it forever, as uh, there was one woman around the table uh, in, in, in the government at the time. And, and then I remember one male colleague saying, like, what gender pay gap? I don't see any gender pay gap. <laughs> and, and you can, you get the feeling why, 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 why nothing is really moving in that direction. So what we've, uh, uh, we, what we've, we have done is that uh, 
uh, first of all, which was again a big fight. We, it's unbelievable that one someone has to fight for that, but I fought for half a year with Ministry of Finance so that they now include in their public service yearbook a section on uh, gender equality. They measured different professions, age, whatever characteristics, but not gender, because we don't have a problem of gender equality. Mm -hmm. Although the statistics office says that it's highest in the EU. So it's a, it's a weird kind of, uh, and that's where I agree, it's not an unconscious bias, it's a very, conscious. very conscious bias. We do not want to deal with this issue. Mm -hmm. Why is that the case? I have no idea. But now it's in there, mm -hmm. so you can check from l last year's uh, uh, public service yearbook, uh, at least there is a understanding now uh, by uh, professional groups where there is a pay gender pay gap and where there isn't. And in public sector actually things are getting much, much better, also partly because of that, because they know that they will be now monitored uh, based on that. I know that in social ministry we made it mon mandatory to uh, for the uh, salary to be published with the um, together with the job offer. But uh, when I tried to uh, touch the private sector just a tiny little bit, uh, then uh, that backlash was incredible. So uh, in Estonia, when you uh, open a CV center or whatever platform where you, where you want to uh, look for an for employee, you can filter out anybody. So you can say that I'm looking for a Russian young girl as a secretary. Uh, why not, if you wish one, right? Uh, so what I wanted to do is that you you would basically disallow this kind of uh, prior selections mm. in the first round at least. Mm. At least look at their CV. You can throw it away. You don't have to you know ask them, but but don't throw them away in a mass way. It's it sounds it's, it's you know it's very robust in my my understanding. Mm. But of course it's uh, turned out to be an incredible uh, infringement on the entrepreneurship uh, freedom and uh, of course uh, my fantastic coalition partner Isama didn't support it. And uh, if you think about it further then in this regard in terms of, of social values of course the political situation has soured since then. So that's the uh, uh, reply why nothing has happened. Yeah, but it probably uh, won't for a long time. It's also coming back to the group thinking, like the same type of people think the same way and also tend to neglect the problems because the proportion between men and women in Estonian parliament actually hasn't changed in 15 years. So maybe two or three people more or less, uh, that's, that's what has been the only change. So I, I think one of the answers is but also there. But, but it also goes to the level of, of ministries and, uh, and so on, although women are a majority mm. in the ministries. Uh, I, I won't say in which ministry it was. Uh, I've worked Be in two. Better not. <laughs> uh, uh, where uh, I asked, why do we have so many Russia, so few Russian speakers in the ministries? We have like 3-4% maybe out of a portion of 30% of population, so you can, you know, uh, maybe say that, okay, some, some of them don't have uh, citizenship, maybe some of them don't speak Estonian enough, but uh, I would guess that maybe 10% would be, you know, at least a minimum or something like that. And then one reason is that Russians don't actually apply, because they usually know that they will be told, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, but secondly, even when they do, they're often not chosen. And I asked the HR person in the ministry, well, well the Estonian speaker just left a better impression. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, what my realization is that basically on, this, on the level of, of leadership, if you, you have to turn attention to that. Uh, you basically have to have rules in place mm. uh, because otherwise uh, it will be down to, well, she just left or he left a better impression. And it might be actually the case that they do leave a better impression because maybe they speak Estonian without an accent. And usually people who speak your language without an accent leave a better impression. So, so if you don't have a, a conscious strategy to deal with these things, then you won't achieve any, any results. I don't believe that, that one can achieve much in this uh, particular area of, of private companies, at least, uh, with regulation. But you can achieve a lot with uh, with uh, uh, positive examples within the sector itself, uh, who usually have a clear agenda for promoting diversity. So it doesn't happen on its own. Uh, this will be my my only long re uh, uh, reply. So s sorry, one more sentence. So 
when we when we tried to uh, work on on gender uh, pay gap uh, a few years ago to to provide a tool which actually gives companies the possibility to gauge their own uh, gender inequality in the company. So you take the statistics office data and the tax board data and you can actually crunch the numbers and show the company that, look, you have a gender inequality in your company, we know that, and do something about it. Uh, then there was again a huge backlash, blah, 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 so all this you know, European crap attacking Estonian values. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, at the time, uh, when we investigated it with many companies, bigger companies, then, then, then a lot of them were actually very surprised that they have a gender pay gap. And, and this is, it's not an a, a unconscious bias, but it's an unconscious sort of process within the company where they would say that, yeah, but women just don't ask for a pay rise and the men, there's so, you know, they're just coming every, every month and then, well, in the end you have to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so by giving them the analytic picture that, look, after three years, this is what has happened in your uh, in your organization. Many of them realize, wow, I, I need to do something. I have to have some clear r rules about it so that I would look that when men don't, you know, run ahead, and so on. Even though your answer was long, it's very hard to uh, uh, object because uh, I was part of the Estonian political life also over a decade, and I thought that it's really bad there. Now that I'm in business. It's even worse. <laughs> so, can I yes. say something? Because okay, maybe please. again, in rotation, maybe he cannot say this explicitly, but you know, you asked this question at the beginning of the session. Do you think that diversity is a good thing? You know, it's important to talk about honestly, and it's don't don't quote me, but I think at the level of the Estonian government and at the highest level of the Estonian state. I don't think it's valued, to be honest. And basically, this is a very short conclusion of what Yevgeny said in those last five minutes. Mm. So, thank you, Ahmed. Now, uh, in, in terms of um, how, how to, um, how you say, uh, improve the HR um, recruitment tools, I think that it's also good to have not only one or two people who look at that but at least three people who, um, I mean, diversity starts at the HR. That's, uh, that's how actually I wanted to say that. Um, because if you have like, you know, three different people with three different backgrounds um, who are going through those CVs and doing those interviews, uh, it's much more likely that you don't get that idea, that, that situation where people say, well, that, that person left a good impression on me because, uh, you know, deep inside I feel that they look like me or they think like me. Um, that's, that's a way to, to really improve very quickly uh, on, on the pool of talents that goes through HR. Because that's the first door. That's a really, really difficult uh, problem for us who, who don't speak always the language perfect. Um, and this is also another issue now because, I mean, if, if you don't want diversity, there's so many reasons. <laughs> you have so many, so many options to, to say that you cannot find good talents. You know, as you said, language could be one of them. You could say, they don't have the right education. I mean, th there's tons of things, you know, to, for you to, to get, a, get away with it. Uh, so again, it has to be a really conscious decision from the leaders. Uh, and it has to be every year publicly, um, uh, how do you say, um, pronounced uh, in, in, in the reportings. Another more important thing is also, you know, I hate that we call ourselves consumers uh, because we're all citizens first and, and we have responsibility to that. But, you know, if you want to use the word consumer, it's also important in that sense. You know, as a person, as individuals, as a country, we have the chance to also um, indicate what we like and don't like to big companies, and especially also to governments. So right now there's a lot of discussions on climate change and how to, you know, travel uh, in a good way, eat well. Uh, you know, all these things, and we want to know everything about our food, our clothing, more and more. We're not still there yet. But the same thing goes for diversity. Um, you know, if you, if, if you are a university student, and, and if you're a university in general, if you get your student educated enough to take a stand and say that, you know, I'm coming out in a one year from now uh, to labor market, and our university or our student body council have decided that we're not going to go to companies who don't have diversity or who not have taken a stand on diversity issues. 
there's all these things we can do also, not only as a business, but also as a consumer or above all as citizens. So this fight cannot stand only on discussions in a panel. It has to be out there and it has to be a um, new way of thinking from the young people who can decide. Um, and, and believe me, business people will change their mind very quickly if they know that there will be no young people applying to them. Because right now, the young people are uh, you know, well sought after talent. Uh, given that we live in this very competitive world, you know, the whole world is open to us right now. So you guys also decide uh, what kind of uh, values those companies host. So now a uh, comment from Pia and then I have two more questions from the audience. Yeah. I actually wanted to get a little bit back earlier. Some of you said that uh, the opposite of, of uh, diversity is discrimination and, and that's kind of a topic that I, that I wanted to also surface. Uh, because uh, that's also visible in a, in a corporate life. Uh, I have a couple of times in my career and encountered units with have a serious bullying kind of a, of, of a problem and, and have had it for some time. And that is extremely threatful for, for any individual for a long period of time that, uh, that experiences discrimination at work, at, at society, at, at life. And that can have a threatful kind of uh, consequences in private life and in the society as a whole. So, so therefore, I, I think that's a good sign to look after as well, that, that is there true diversity to somehow to, to find si possible signs of discrimination or, or bullying. And, and that's a sign of kind of this uh, everyday discussion that are we truly diverse? Do we truly respect diversity? And, and are we kind of open for the benefits that that brings? But fully en encourage all of us to, to look those signs. And we have one question from there and then also one from here. Yep. Hi, I'm Johanna. Um, basically, We've been talking about how diversity is an issue and how it's uh, how we need more of it, and we were like how the Estonian government maybe doesn't value it as much as, as as they should. But I don't think we've touched on the reasons why should we like why should we include more people, not also more women, not also like more uh, ethnically diverse, but also people with disabilities and uh, and everyone. Mm -hmm. Like if we had to just. One reason, what would it be? So the benefits. I, 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 I think I told my own, re uh, own uh, my only reason or main reason because others are much better in, in, in addressing others. It's uh, human rights, it's fundamental. It's, it's, it's a matter of being human. Uh, and uh, anybody who is systematically discriminated uh, based on a characteristic or character trait that they cannot change uh, it's inhumane behavior towards those people and I don't want to live in a world where this is happening systematically uh, in any society and I think that this is the main, ma most fundamental issue. I have asked once a provocative question whether a feminist can be a homophobe. Uh, sociologically, of course, uh, people can have conflicting beliefs but I don't think that it's actually possible. Uh, it's a matter of solidarity, actually, of empathy towards uh, other people, of, of actually taking other people as people, not as members of some, you know, whatever group. And for, for that reason, for example, uh, you mentioned people with disabilities. I was uh, very, very, very uh, positively moved when uh, uh, the Union of People with Disabilities supported the Cohabitation Act, which, uh, which is uh, actually about, say, rights of gay people. But based precisely on that understanding that, you know, we have to stick together those people who are actually underrepresented, who are in some sense threatened within a society. And, and this kind of solidarity and empathy building, I think, is, is, is very important. But, but why? It's, I think it's a matter of, of, of uh, humanism. Okay, a few more um, comments. Absolutely, I fully agree with you again, but I, I'd like to add that it's, it's, it's better for all of us as a society because it's going to be a better society. I mean, we don't just have white males in Estonia, or in Sweden, or in Finland. You know, we have females and, you know, people from different ethnic groups and people with disabilities and gay people and straight people. And there are so many different groups and all these groups must feel that you know they have a voice and they can do certain things so it's it's all about sort of having a normal society which is looking after each of its members not just after one specific group so this is my sort of like i don't know 
humanistic viewpoint, but business-wise, I mean, if you're not interested in human values and that kind of thing, I mean, there was this recent study done uh, a couple of years ago uh, among 70,000 uh, sort of, you know, business, uh, business uh, members, um, and it showed that, you know, more diverse business organizations basically had 20% more revenue. And it's a very solid piece of research. And when we talk about diversity, it's not just ethnic diversity. It's age, it's gender, different disciplines, different career paths, and so on and so forth, six different components. So even if you're not really interested in egalitarianism or values like this, which I strongly subscribe for. Should, so. Yeah, they should, <laughs> I know, I know. But if you're not, I'm not going to... I'm. I'm I wish I could impose my set of values, but at least for those people who are more interested, you know, in money and power and that kind of thing, and we do know that there is a very sort of important, strong group of people in Estonia who see those <laughs> values as more important. It's still diversity, it's still good, because it brings in more money. So it's good in every possible way. We have yeah. time uh, yeah. for, okay, I'm yeah. giving you a comment, and then last question, because actually our time is up. Actually, I would like to say that uh, this diversity goes behind uh, human rights because uh, we are intelligent creatures and we need to bring value to each other's lives, not just give you uh, your human rights, but uh, help to, to grow ourselves as human beings, as intelligent creatures. And it goes beyond human rights for me, at least. <laughs> Last question. And since we are not allowed here to discriminate other <laughs> uh, discussions, we are not allowed to go over time, so it's got to be a short question. Thank you. I was going to have a whole lecture. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, well, no, I have no problem with diversity. I have a hyphenated name. I'm Ilvi Cannon from Joe Cannon. From U uh, and I've been uh, a volunteer uh, at the Estonian Women's uh, Study Center, uh, almost as long as uh, Evgeny was, well, he was in a school <laughs> bench uh, attending school when I started. So anyway, yes, we have a problem about the gender pay gap in the country, but I must say, when I, and we have a problem with discrimination. I remember when I first moved here and sitting around a table uh, with Estonians, coming back to my land of birth, so happy, and I raised a question about, you know, what about discrimination? Uh, and uh, the people were stunned. They hadn't even thought of that word back then. And they said, well, there is no discrimination in this country. So it's what we've come a long way. And and I'm quite convinced that we will continue to go because the gender pay gap has been a public issue now for several years. And it is uh, something that we need to work out. But my question uh, is, uh, in all this globalized and world and the corporate world and so forth, um, we have nation states. And uh, what about the language issue? I'm very concerned here in Estonia, too. We have a concern about the language issue when we have these hiring practice and so forth and so on. Uh, what about the native language of a country where a corporation comes in and uh, uh, is very much interested in making money? I don't, they don't come here because they like our blue eyes. No, 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 no. They come here because they see potential and they want to make money. So uh, what about that? Uh, the state, uh, nation states and their, we talked about culture, 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 I heard the word, but not nation state and what it means in a corporate challenging world. Thank you. So who wants to go first? Two comments we can take. Uh, I think that it's, it, it is important that, I mean, in terms of a country, you have to learn the language. That's not a problem. But at the same time, um, more and more is diverse society. So you will hear all kind of languages. I mean, in Sweden, 
the language is still very key in terms of integration. Uh, and it's not only the Swedes who think it's very important to learn the language. Actually, we did an interview uh, with 2,000 people who live in a, who come from different countries, and they all say the language is also very, very important. Um, and I mean, there's an idea of that immigration and diversity uh, is a threat to the national state or the national identity. Uh, it's usually the opposite. Um, people who come to uh, new countries, um, in this case Sweden, they are actually much more hopeful about Swede Sweden as future. Uh, they are actually much more caring about Sweden because they know what they left. Um, so I always, I don't usually see that um, nation state and globalization, you know, it's, it's always uh, uh, um, on a clash. Mm -hmm. In terms of borders, in terms of you know everything else, it will change and it has to change because we very much becoming very globalized. Um, but in terms of businesses who come to 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 our countries, um, I don't think their idea is to um, how do you say uh, take over the nation state. I mean, of course, uh, huge corporations all over around the world. Uh, some of them actually more powerful in terms of income than countries. Yes, um, but it, it, I don't see it as, um, as a threat, uh, to be honest. Um, and I think that even though the nation state will exist, it will change its nature and how it operates. Mm -hmm. And it's just a natural thing. It, it's never been, nothing has ever lasted forever. Mm -hmm. Everything has always been tweaked and changed. And it's very difficult now when these changes are c coming so fast and we are aware of them because we have you know, social media and telephones and everything in our hands. So it's also an anxiety dealing with so much information, which our brain is not made for. So the world is changing, but but it's not as bad as people think. It's actually getting much better than what, what it, people say. Due to the lack of time, I'm not allowed to take any more answers. It is a good answer. But, but I think it was a very good answer. And I, I have a one question that I would like each of you just to answer with one word and that's, this will be the summary. So we talked about, actually it was Ahmed who brought it in the word vaccination. So if you could choose one, one uh, vaccine against discrimination, against what would it be? One characteristic, like against what? Who wants to go first? Uh, I can go first. Okay. Uh, tolerance and noticing other people around you. Okay. Uh, kind of uh, uh, limited competencies. I know. Is it like I'm? I'm not quite sure. I understood your question. One vaccination against uh, one type of discrimination. Yeah. What would it be? I know it's hard. You just have to choose. One. Mm -hmm. No, just go on. I have to think about it. It's too deep. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was. It would be uh, um, letting people meet each other. I mean, creating meeting places. Uh, there's no better way than you know sitting face to face, shaking hands. Um, diversity you cannot learn in a book. You have to. You have to exercise it. You have to experiment it. Uh, and this is where we are missing today. Um, so I can go on for a long time, okay. but no I'll stop there. I, 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 one I, word. I, yeah. I was actually going to say the same thing, but mm. I'll, I'll, I'll use another one then. I, it's, uh, in terms of uh, society, it uh, um, must be demands uh, from citizens towards uh, their political leaders, because if there is no demand, then as we can see, there is no supply. Yeah. After the discussion, you can all start demanding. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Anu, are you ready now to say that one word? Mm, I'll just say tolerance. tolerance. I'm not sure if it should be negative or positive, but I think tolerance will do the job for now. All right. Thank you for coming. I also wanted to talk about inclusive dis decision making, but it was impossible with this time frame. Thank you all for listening, for nice questions. <laughs>